This is going to be a really concise summary. There'll be another video that goes into more detail about this particular event, but these are the bare bone facts that you need in order to understand what the analysis of the happiness letter is going to be about. Okay, so 1842. Joseph Smith arranges a private meeting between himself and Nancy Rigdon, the 19-year-old daughter of Sidney Rigdon. In this meeting, he proposes that he and Nancy Rigdon enter into some sort of illicit relationship. We don't know if this is a concubine or a plural wife or spiritual wifery, but some sort of proposal of this nature is made. Nancy forcefully rejects it. And furthermore, she says, I'm going to scream about what's happening here if you don't let me leave. Joseph lets her leave after he promises that he is going to write a letter explaining how his proposal is actually in line with God's commandments and is actually a righteous thing rather than some sort of lustful, sinful thing. The next day, Joseph's scribe and close friend, Apostle Willard Richards, delivers this letter to Nancy. And it starts out with a stanza that will be familiar to any Mormon who's been paying attention to conference. Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we but pursue the path that leads to it. At any rate, there is a great confrontation between Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon because Sidney's daughter, Nancy, tells him what Joseph Smith did. Joseph goes to the house, immediately denies that any such proposal happened. Nancy Rigdon storms into the room and says, Joseph, you're lying. He, he, he says he admits that he did make the proposal, but that it was to test her virtue, after which Sidney Rigdon produces the letter and says, well, what about this letter? Because the letter says that it's something much more than that. And finally, Joseph admits that he had made that proposition. There's a great falling out between Joseph and Sidney over this. There's eventually a, a, a sort of reconciliation that happens, which allows Sidney to keep his place in the church. Um, we're going to have a separate video that goes into all of these specific details. But those are the bare bones. Basically, Joseph Smith makes a proposal to Nancy. She rejects it. He promises to write a letter. And the letter that survives to this day, which is Joseph's argument for how his proposal could be seen as righteousness, um, is found in the pages of the happiness letter. And that's what the rest of this video is about. So without further ado, the happiness letter presentation from 2019 Sunstone in Salt Lake City. All right. So, um, if any of you are familiar with the blog Thoughts on Things and Stuff or the YouTube channel Thinker of Thoughts, then you'll know that uh, I start with history and then try to dive a little bit deeper and look into the context of some other religious movements and see what we can learn from there and then apply to our analysis of Joseph Smith. Um, I had the benefit of, of Chris's excellent um, historical presentation, so I don't have to go into that as much, but we're gonna take a dive into looking at the language of the happiness letter and reflect on whether or not it matches the pattern that we may find in other religious sexual predators. Now, if we want to know what a religious sexual predator looks like, then we kind of have to look at the history of other religious sexual predators so that we can kind of figure out how a duck quacks so that if we hear a duck quack, we can know that it's a duck. So we've got an example here of six different religious professors, and you may actually recognize some of the stories. Uh, this is Wayne Bent here in the um, upper left-hand corner. He claimed that God was going to destroy him if he did not have sex with his daughter-in-law. We've got um, uh, David Koresh, down in the lower left-hand corner, who claimed that there was a, a significant scripturally based religious justification for him to dissolve the marriage bonds of everybody in his flock so that women could have, so he could have sexual access to the women in his flock for a very biblical reason. Uh, we've got other representatives who were able to come up with religious and biblical and theological justifications for their unorthodox sexual activities, and they were different from each other. So a member of one group might look out at one of the other groups and say, that, that prophet has it all wrong. My prophet is the real prophet. But at, when, at the end of the day, you really have to engage in a form of special pleading in order to do that. But we're going to try to avoid that pitfall of special pleading when we do this analysis. So when you look 
at all of these different stories and you try to paint the picture of a religious sexual predator, you're going to find some things pop up again and again. You're going to find that the individual claims divine sanction for their unorthodox sexual practices. You're going to see them appeal to the devotion and piety of the targets of their predations. You're going to find that they have created religious justification. In some cases, it may be as simple as, well, God said that love is love and we're going to interpret that as sexual love and it's free. That would be the case of uh, the leader of the children of God. Um, Or it may be a more complex, multi-layered theological justification. And we're left to decide whether or not the degree of ornate justification sublimates something that we would otherwise consider abominable or whether it really doesn't make a difference. So when you look down at the, at the root mechanisms of these types of manipulations, when it, and if you want to learn about it, you can do searches for documentaries about these different group leaders and listen to the stories of the survivors so you can see how they were able to take people who started out with conventional moral Um, a moral compass of what was right and the boundaries of propriety and their morality was subverted by the messaging and the the self-proclaimed prophet used enticement, they used fear, they used guilt, threat, obligation, all of these things were part of the toolkit of the religious manipulator and it was all bound up by secrecy. All right, so the happiness letter. Now, when you guys, how many people here know what the happiness letter is or have heard of it before today? If you take some time and you're in your ward or anything, you might ask people, you know, do you know what the happiness letter is? And chances are you'll have my experience where people are like, what is that? I I don't know what that is. But uh, they will probably have heard it if you start with the first stanza because it's a very familiar stanza. Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. So we're going to take a moment and we're going to go through the happiness letter stanza by stanza. And we're going to examine the the language of manipulation that is woven throughout the letter. All right. So let's talk about the language and mechanics of manipulation. Now, in any manipulative endeavor, the perpetrator begins with some knowledge of his target, his mark. He wants to understand the motivations, desires, insecurities, and proclivities of his target. And this allows him to tailor his approach so that it will hit just the right notes to persuade, but also to give the target the sense that their submission is voluntary and the product of their own free will and priority. In many cases, which we see at the start of this letter, the the manipulation starts with an appeal to something that the target desires. This is the honey in the trap, the bait on the hook. And the target's desire for this bait becomes the fuel for the rest of the manipulation. Now, such enticements could be strictly secular. This type of focus is common in financial forms of fraud. For example, Bernie Madoff appealed to his client's desires for financial success, and that was enhanced by the sense of an elite status that you qualified for his unique investment skills. Scheme. The people behind pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes, cash gifting circles, and other forms of financial fraud will often use these secular types of enhancements. Uh, but there are uh, religious manipulations as well, and these draw upon more existential desires, divine acceptance, healing, salvation, spiritual rebirth, absolution, enlightenment. All of these touchstones have been used by various religious charlatans throughout history. Now, these metaphysical objects of desire are enhanced when they're tied together with other coveted ideas, prosperity, well-being in this life and the next. And these may be connected with the spiritual obligations that are communicated by the predator. The elite feeling of being among a chosen people with special callings, trials, blessings is a really strong appeal, particularly to vulnerable people who may have little else in their life to feel elite about. Now, if you examine all of those, those six men that we have there, you'll find elements of this in, every, in the story of every one of their survivors. Now, in the opening line, Joseph invokes a very universal enticement, happiness. Now, notice that Joseph is not adorning his enticement with a complex theological framework that emphasizes the need to seal or bind families together. Now, that's a common apologetic rationale that is used to justify Joseph's unconventional polygamous proposals, but it's no Nowhere in this letter. He begins instead with something simple and pure, the state of happiness in this life and the next. Now, this is something which even a child could respond positively to, and it doesn't require any deep doctrinal elaboration. 
Now, alluding to this promised state of bliss is not the whole of Joseph's manipulation. The manipulation takes a clearer shape when the if-then statements begin to appear. Now, Joseph quickly establishes the requirements for this promised blessing using the metaphor of a path which must be followed. Happiness will be the ultimate state of our eternal existence if we follow the path to it. And this concept serves as the foundation for the rest of the letter. Joseph spends the next several paragraphs defining the path and establishing the consequences for those who either accept or reject his prescriptions. Now notice that Joseph, throughout this letter, uses inclusive language. He says, we, our, he he includes himself. And he does this to make it seem as though he and his target are under the same requirements, when in fact they are in very different positions. Joseph is the one setting up the hoops to jump through, while Nancy is the one who must do the jumping to get the prize. Now, it should be noted here as well that the theme of happiness is one which would be familiar to Nancy, and that's because both Joseph and Sidney spoke at that funeral, and Sidney's sermon was on the theme of happiness. Joseph may have used this language in order to give a sense of familiarity and propriety to his petition, sort of twisting the trust that she had for her father against her. All right, so let's go to the next stanza. Uh, And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. Now, I want you to take a look at this list. It's made up entirely of seemingly positive ideals. An individual who considers themselves religious or spiritual, even without knowing the source, could look at this list as a series of guiding moral ideals and principles, each ideal appealing to their own aspirations of goodness. But this is all part of the deception. On the surface, there is nothing which really raises a red flag, but it's important to remember that these ideas of virtue, holiness, and divine command are subject to the definition of whoever claims the authority to define them. Now, throughout history, a wide array of religious con artists have distorted and redefined these notions to alarming degrees. Here are some examples. For a member of the children of God, virtue may be found in following the teachings of its leader, David Berg, which includes using sexual enticement to gain converts and involving children in abusive sexual activities. For a member of the Church of Christ scientist, uprightness may be achieved by adhering to the admonition of the church's founders, Mary Baker Eddy, and rejecting medical science in favor of faith healing and the idea that all sickness is the result of spiritual weakness. For a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses, faithfulness may be proven by denying a sick one a life-saving blood transfusion resulting in a preventable death, or by completely cutting a loved one out of your life if they choose to leave the faith. And this is all encouraged by the men in the governing body of the institution. For a member of the Unification Church, holiness may be attained by surrendering one's will to sinful humanity and consenting to be married to a stranger in a mass ceremony in order to be grafted into God's sinless lineage under the blessing of church founder Sun Young Moon. Now, while some of these examples are more benign than others, the alarming principle at work here is the notion that individuals claiming special divine sanction are able to use supposed divine authority and the name of God to compel people to do things that they would otherwise completely reject. All of these examples involve people following a path towards happiness as defined by their respective charismatic leader. Joseph also follows this pattern and makes sure to include the catch-all concept by summarizing the path to virtue being found in the statement that you must follow all the commandments of God with a strong emphasis on the all. All right, let's go to the next section. We cannot keep all the commandments without first knowing them, and we cannot expect to know all or more than we know unless we comply with or keep those we have already received. Now, here Joseph is using a sense of urgency and lists more requirements. This sets up another assault on the conscience of his target. 
Joseph has already planted the idea that his target cannot achieve true happiness unless they follow all of God's commandments. And now he's establishing that an individual can't even learn what all of the commandments are unless they're obeying those which they've already been given. The fact that Joseph chooses to convey this message only after claiming that he has been given a commandment to take Nancy as a secret illegal plural wife should not be overlooked. The unspoken imperative here is that neither Joseph nor his target will be able to achieve happiness unless they comply. Another danger here is that this compels people in Joseph's orbit to obey anything that he puts forth under the name of God, both now and in the future. Now, you can review the bad outcomes of groups under the influence of religious manipulation. Jonestown, the Branch Davidians, Heaven's Gate, each of these reveal that the horrific outcomes was facilitated by a charismatic leader who wove a web of undue influence over the minds of their followers. This is characterized by the notion that the leader's instructions could only be righteously answered by obedience. Now, the leaders did not start out by giving the extreme commands which led to the deadly headlines. Rather, they started by instilling the notion that obedience to the leader was equivalent to obedience to God and should be done without question or doubt. Now, it's not the extreme outcome of these examples which is the problem. It is the culture of irreproachable authority which lies behind them. Even if a group doesn't end up involved in mass suicide, if the teachings and expectations of the leader or leaders imposes this high demand for obedience upon the members, that is the moral and ethical root of the problem. This demand for obedience is the underlying message woven throughout Joseph's happiness letter. Obedience at the threat of one's eternal soul. It echoes through the issues of polygamy into the Mountain Meadows massacre, racism, sexual abuse, and even bigotry of today. Joseph has set up the stakes, and next he delivers the linchpin of his entire religious ethic, a concept which places his commands above the conscience and judgment of his target. This is the next, this is a key section. That which is wrong under one circumstance may be and often is right under another. God said, thou shalt not kill. At another time, he said, thou shalt utterly destroy. This is the principle on which the government of heaven is conducted by revelation adapted to the circumstances in which the children of the kingdom are placed. Now, remember that Joseph is drafting this letter to a 19-year-old young woman who has refused his proposal for secret illegal bigamy, a practice that she saw as adultery. He's creating a religious justification for how and why this woman could receive his proposition as an act of righteousness and see him as a man of God, even though his request violates her sense of virtue, morality, and godliness. At the core of his message, Joseph endeavors to use religious rhetoric to make that which is wrong appear right. He introduces this concept and in so doing points out that these circumstantial exceptions are not extremely rare, but are in fact frequent enough to be described as occurring often. In order to make this point, Joseph uses the effective approach of taking something even more offensive than sexual sin and showing how it could be seen as righteousness. Thou shalt not kill the scriptural injunction against murder found in Exodus in the Ten Commandments. If Joseph could turn this instruction on its head and show how God could justify killing in certain circumstances, then a call for polygamy would be almost trivial by comparison. And accordingly, Joseph does just this. Thou shalt utterly destroy Four words that are only found together once in scripture in Deuteronomy 20 as part of instructions for the complete and utter killing of the inhabitants of six different cities to include men, women, and children. Now, this particular scripture is the subject of a great deal of debate in modern times because it's often interpreted as an example of God commanding genocide. Those who defend the Bible spend a great deal of effort trying to demonstrate how this is not exactly the case. They appeal to many different moral rationales to do so. Joseph does not do this, however. He cites this scripture as an example of God by command through a prophet overturning the prohibition on murder due to circumstance. Joseph accepts this passage as a command for genocide and uses that contradiction to rationalize his violation of monogamy and sexual fidelity on the basis of divine revelation and command. 
Joseph states that these moral contradictions occur as a principle upon which the kingdom of God is based, citing revelation and circumstances to imply that they are simple, commonplace administrative procedures and should even be expected. Keep in mind that at no point in the entire happiness letter does Joseph ever directly mention marriage or sexual morality. He cites murder and theft, but steers away from directly addressing his subject. Joseph's reminder that this principle applies to children of the kingdom serves two manipulative purposes. First, it allows his target to feel the pride of being part of an exclusive chosen followers of the restored kingdom of God, something made possible by Joseph himself. Second, it reinforces the idea that people receiving these contradictory instructions are like children, immature, naive, and thus unable to understand or question the wisdom behind the apparent contradictions that they are compelled to accept. Still, Joseph understands that he's not addressing a subdued sycophant. Nancy has already demonstrated her moral grounding and resilience in the face of his prophetic claims. Therefore, Joseph knows he has to apply every bit of his powers of persuasion to overcome her conscientious objection, which means finding a way for her to doubt her own judgment. And the next section of the letter adopts this tactic directly. Whatever God commands is right, no matter what it is. Although we may not see the reason thereof till long after events transpire. If we seek first the kingdom of God, all good things will be added. So with Solomon. First he asked wisdom and God gave it him and with it every desire of his heart. Even things which might be considered abominable to all who understand the order of heaven only in part, but which in reality were right because God gave and sanctioned by special revelation. Now, Joseph starts this section by reinforcing the most important concept of this letter, that no matter what God through Joseph may command, it should be considered right and just. This is a form of divine command morality, which is the weapon of choice for religious charlatans and manipulators. Joseph then plants the seed of doubt about one's own personal judgment by warning that they may not see the reason that such offensive commands are actually right till long after events transpire. Joseph is instructing his target to quell their own doubts and stifle their conscience. Those concerns are just the product of childish and limited minds, Joseph suggests, and should be ignored in favor of anything that Joseph says God commands. After giving a reason for Nancy to doubt her own wisdom in objecting to such prophetic instructions, Joseph offers her a new kind of wisdom, a wisdom embodied by the scriptural paragon of wisdom Solomon himself. This leads to an important subtext in this part of the letter. In describing the blessings of Solomon, Joseph is indirectly referring to the taking of multiple wives and concubines, as Solomon is famous for 700 wives and 300 concubines. Doctrine and Covenants section 132 invokes the name of Solomon. Solomon for the same reason. Joseph reminds Nancy that Solomon's faithfulness resulted in both wisdom as well as treasure and the desires of his heart, things which were otherwise considered gratuitous. The implication here is that taking numerous wives is something that was the part of every desire of Solomon's heart. Joseph is demonstrating that desire can be seen as driving a prophet's action in secretly pursuing women other than his first wife and may be counted as righteousness, even though it would otherwise be considered lust. To make this point even more clear, Joseph acknowledges that such thing might be considered abominable to those ignorant of God's purposes, immediately placing potential objectors into the category of the ignorant by ways and ignorant of the ways and purposes of God. Joseph explains, however, that it's easy to avoid this fate if one understands that God gave special permission to Solomon to accept these abominations by revelation. Thus, Joseph's abominations may be accepted for the same reason, and the abominations are sublimated into righteousness. Joseph is very careful to make sure that he alone is able to sanction and receive such revelations and proclaim God's command and blessings. This letter is a glimpse into how that singular power is wielded in the private lives of those in Joseph's world. Not content to stop at the examples he's already provided, Joseph uses another analogy to make the point that his illicit proposal was divinely approved. A parent may whip a child, and justly too, because he stole an apple, whereas if the child had asked for the apple, the child would have eaten it with a better appetite, and there would have been no stripes. All the pleasures of the apple would have been secured, and the misery of stealing lost. This principle will justly apply to all God's dealing with his children. 
Now, since Joseph has now dealt with the issue of divine punishment for the proposal of his secret adulterous bigamy, he turns to the, his attention to the fears of punishment, which he understands are undoubtedly clouding the mind of his young prey. He needs to assure her that the fears of damnation and hellfire, which usually accompany sexual sin, are not in store if she accepts. Rather, pleasures await his target for consenting to his proposition. Under normal circumstances, such an act would carry a painful penalty, but this situation is one which has been granted special allowance by God, according to Joseph, who claims to speak for God because he said so. To convey this reassurance, Joseph employs the metaphor of a child stealing an apple, just as a child who asks permissions to eat, to eat an apple will enjoy its pleasures more fully, so too will the young woman who accepts Joseph's secret arrangement to be able to freely enjoy the results. Joseph closes by filing this little bit of sophistry under the category of God's dealing with his children. He slathers the language of piety over this brazen manipulation in order to exploit the godly mindset of his target. This is how religious manipulators take advantage of religiously minded people. Next, Joseph draws a clear distinction between those secret illegal marriages which were sanctioned by God and those which were not. Now, examining the historical context of Nauvoo in the spring of 1842 will demonstrate why this distinction is critical, as we heard. All right, next section. Everything that God gives us is lawful and right, and it is proper that we should enjoy his gifts and blessings whenever and wherever he is disposed to bestow. But if we should seize upon those blessings and enjoyments without Without law, without revelation, without commandment, those blessings and enjoyments would prove cursings and vexations in the end, and we should have to lie down in sorrow and wailings of everlasting regret. Now, while in the prior section, Joseph assured his young target that she need fear no punishment for consenting to his illicit advances, here he provides a counterpoint that anyone who would try to indulge themselves in such extracurricular activities, but without the express commandment and revelation from God, is committing sin and is therefore subject to everlasting punishment. This section serves two purposes for Joseph. First, it indirectly gives his target a sense of being special in the eyes of God. It is she who was chosen for this special blessing and privilege, while others who have not received this blessing would be harshly punished for violating God's commands. This sense of being special in the eyes of God can be very alluring, particularly to insecure young people who yearn for acknowledgement. No doubt this tactic had worked for Joseph in the past. By the time of his approach of Nancy Rigdon, Joseph had already secretly entered extra-legal relations with 10 women other than his wife, within the range of age 16 to 47. Second, Joseph's direct condemnation of those who would indulge their desires without the blessings of God serves to quell concerns Nancy might have based on current events and rumors going around Nauvoo at this time. At the time of the letter's creation, there were rumors circulating in Nauvoo that high-level leaders in the church were engaged in secret sexual relations with women with the use of religious justification. Joseph and other leaders have publicly condemned those ideas and denied any similar practice. This section serves to to rectify that apparent disparity in the mind of his target. Now, just six months prior to this statement, Joseph delivered a sermon declaring, if we do not accuse one another, God would not accuse us. And if we had no accuser, we should enter into heaven. Going on to say, what many people call sin is not sin. This gave doctrinal cover to the notion that if illicit relations were kept secret, then there would be no sin found in them, especially if done with the blessing of Joseph. In the spring of 1842, the very time that Joseph is approaching Nancy, the High Council in Nauvoo is receiving testimony from women acknowledging that leaders such as John C. Bennett, then mayor and one of the counselors in the presidency, is using this justification in order to take on spiritual wives and have sexual intercourse with them. The testimonies recorded regarding this incident invoke the idea that Joseph gave sanction to having secret relation by special permission, just as Joseph is teaching in this letter. Other men and leaders of the church are implicated in these accusations, including the prophet's own brother, Apostle William Smith. In the aftermath of these disclosures, Joseph denies ever teaching any such principle and demands that the men involved publicly deny he ever sanctioned their actions. 
This letter demonstrates that Joseph was, in fact, asserting that special permission can be granted by the prophet for things which are otherwise considered moral abominations. The difference here is that when those accusations against Bennett and others became public, Joseph was able to deny that he had ever given such permission and so could paint the offenders publicly as sinners while privately fulfilling his own desires for relations with multiple women. This distinction between illicit act Activities which are rendered divine by special permission and those which are damnable for their lack of it carries through today in the narrative of the church. It's one of the primary talking points of apologists addressing the issue of Joseph Smith's polygamy. Now, keep in mind that special divine permission is nothing new when you look at religious charlatans. Self-proclaimed prophet David Koresh of the Branch Davidians claimed special divine permission to take child brides for the purpose of producing the 24 elders foretold in the book of Revelations. Special proclaimed prophet Wayne Bent of the Lord Our Righteousness Church claimed special divine permission for having sexual relations with children, even his own daughter-in-law, in order to avoid God's punishment. Self-proclaimed prophet Julius Shacknow of the sect known as The Work claimed special privilege to promise salvation in exchange for sexual intercourse with women and children, including his own stepdaughter. Self-proclaimed prophet Tony Alamo of, of Alamo Christian Ministries claims special biblical permission to illegally marry multiple women and children. Special proclaimed prophet David Berg of the Children of God claimed special divine permission to normalize sexual relation with children. Prophets justifying their own predations as special divine permission through the use of pious language and religious sentiment is nothing new. They should be seen for the predators that they are. But how is a naive 19-year-old in the 1800s, confronted by the very prophet she has revered from the age of eight, supposed to know that? Joseph uses this section of the letter to impose his authority to draw the line between illicit relations that receive God's blessings and those which do not. Having underlined this point, Joseph then moves on to reinforce the theme of happiness as linked to his proposition. All right, so moving on to the next section. But in obedience, there is joy and peace unspotted, unalloyed. And as God has designed our happiness, the happiness of all all his creatures, he never has, he never will institute an ordinance or give a commandment to his people that is not calculated in its nature to promote that happiness which he has designed and which will not end in the greatest amount of good and glory to those who become the recipients of his laws and ordinances. Now, one of the most powerful ways to induce someone to act against their previously held principles is to subvert their higher values. Joseph knows that his target is extremely devout and God-fearing, and he's already inculcated her mind with the idea that he alone can declare the will of God. He's declared his deviant proposal to be a righteous and blessed command of God and attempted to alleviate his target's fear of punishment because his proposition contradicts her own moral sensibilities. He is leveraging her reverence of God against her own moral conscience. He takes the concept a step further by conflating obedience to to God with obedience to a man who claims to speak for God. In Joseph's eye, there's no distinction between the two. So as long as it's Joseph's version of God's commands that are obeyed. Joseph continues to wax poetic about the glorious blessings that will accompany obedience to his will, a joy and happiness that are actually God's design from the beginning. In fact, Joseph assures his young target that God would never command anything that would lead to anything other than happiness, and not just any happiness, but the greatest amount of good and glory. This is exactly how religious predators play the trust me I only want what's best for you card this idea certainly carries more weight when you transpose it so that it appears to come from God but the intentions are the same the goal of the charlatan is to break down any resistance or concern that may exist in the mind of their target so that the trusting target can be induced to surrender to their will for those who want proof of the fictitious nature of this promise that obedience to polygamy can only lead to happiness just look at the lives of the women who were subsequently afflicted with it. Even the most vocal modern apologist for the church on polygamy, Brian Hales, concedes that it was a terrible experience in practice, far from the promised bliss of this letter. In the end, the modern church can only rely on law, command, and obedience as justification for the practice of polygamy because conscience, ethics, equality, morality, and stability all scream out against it.
The next section, blessings offered but rejected are no longer blessings, but become like the talent hid in the earth by the wicked and slothful servant. The proffered good returns to the giver. The blessing is bestowed on those who will receive and occupy for unto him that hath shall be given and he shall have abundantly, but unto him who hath not or will not receive shall be taken away that which he hath or might have had. Here it becomes apparent that there's a pattern to Joseph's letter. He repeatedly alternates between offering positive assurances and blessings for accepting his proposition or offering threats and punishment for refusing it. This section carries the theme of negative consequences for refusal. Pleasant language and biblical imagery are employed to soften the message that anyone who refuses to be Joseph's secret bride or sexual plaything is wicked and slothful. Not only will they miss out on the glorious blessings, they'll also lose blessings that they already have now. This is perhaps the nicest way to make a bold-faced threat against someone who may rebel. It would not be surprising to hear such a threat be uttered by an organized crime syndicate against a business owner. After all, you know, gee, you will be a shame if something was, uh, you know, to happen to that nice store you got. That routine is very common in the shakedown. Manipulative religionists follow this routine in a different way. As Joseph showcases here, it would be like, gee, it would be a shame if all those blessings that you were enjoying were to be taken away. These are not the words of a man of God instilling virtue. These are the words of a predator who uses tacit threats and manipulation to induce a vulnerable target to fall victim to his carnal designs. Now, by including a poetic stanza here, Joseph takes a cue from John C. Bennett. Be wise today, tis madness to defer. The next day the fatal precedent may plead thus on till wisdom is pushed out of time into eternity. Now, if you read Bennett's expose or any of his writing, he interjects poetry very, very frequently. And we can see here Joseph is kind of adopting this approach. He cites a verse which uses emotionally charged language such as madness, fatal precedent, wisdom, eternity, in an attempt to override the moral conscience of a youth with urgency and fear. This subtle manipulation speaks to Joseph's amoral intuition and facility with language, specifically the power of language to influence others. Joseph was a powerful orator in public and in private. Nancy's resistance to this manipulation is a testament to her character and strength. Having laid down some tacit threats, Joseph now shifts to making glorious promises once again. Our Heavenly Father is more liberal in his views and boundless in his mercies and blessings than we are ready to receive. Once again, Joseph attempts to redefine morality in the mind of his prey. If he can introduce a vague uncertainty about the boundaries of propriety, he can then more easily redefine morality on the strength of his claimed status as the mouthpiece of God. If God's views are more liberal than we're equipped to receive, it means that our old-fashioned notions of sin and moral behavior are potentially more strict than God actually intends. This branch of thought neatly complements Joseph's November 1841 sermon where he declared that what many people call sin is not sin. And these ideas carry the combined implication that the prudish objections to Joseph's extra-legal marital adventures are actually based on the outdated and overly restrictive morals and keep objectors from actually receiving God's blessings. This is the effect intended upon the mind of young Nancy. Moving on, and at the same time is more terrible to the workers of iniquity, more awful in the executions of his punishments, and more ready to detect every false way than we are apt to suppose him to be. He will be inquired of by his children. He says, ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find, but if ye will take that which is not your own or which I have not given you, you shall be rewarded according to your deeds. Again, Joseph switches to offering threats. And the brilliance of these contrasting themes in his letters is that he's shaping a new moral framework in the mind of his target. If Nancy's conscience was previously defined by principles such as devotion, fidelity, chastity, Joseph is breaking those ideas down and redefining morality by reframing it to match his own goals. The new moral boundaries can be located by observing where the blessings and punishments are staked. According to Joseph, devotion is found in compliance with God's commands through his prophet. Fidelity is defined as staying true to God and his prophet. Chastity is expanded to be a concept that allows any relationship given special permission by God's prophet. Underlying all of this is the unavoidable truth that in Joseph's new religious framework, there is only one virtue, obedience. All other virtues are subordinate to obedience, and obedience may trump any other virtue at any other time, allowing even extremes of murder and genocide should God, through Joseph, command it, making polygamy trivial. 
But no good thing will I withhold from them who walk uprightly before me and do my will in all things and will listen to my voice in the voice of my servant who I have sent. Now, when David Koresh, Marshall Applewhite, Jim Jones, or any other self-proclaimed mouthpiece of God instructs others to submit to some heinous act which betrays their conscience, the prudent response is to recoil, to reject their claims and see these men for the pretenders that they are. The idea that God would use such men to order abominable things refutes their claim to speak for God in the first place. The deception of these charlatans is laid bare, no matter how flowing, beautiful, or pious their rhetoric. They will insist that their, their words are not their own, but God's, and thus cannot be rejected. To object to those instructions is to object to God's will. Charlatans continue to employ this tactic because it is so effective against devoted people who have a deep, sincere desire to please God and who are not familiar with the methods of such manipulation. Jo- Joseph mimics this tactic here in this stanza. He promises blessings for complete obedience while subtly giving equivalence to the voice of God and his own. He uses the voice of God to declare that he is God's mouthpiece in a bit of circular logic that can only be seen by those who are not already under his spell. Joseph God here is speaking with words found nowhere else in scripture. He is delivering a revelation that is no less universal or significant than those found in the Doctrine and Covenants. In society today, a middle-aged man using the name of God against a teenage girl, inducing her to secretly commit and make herself sexually available to him, is correctly identified as a manipulative predator. Such predators have existed for as long as people have held special reverence for God. In the case of the happiness letter, Joseph exposes his true character to match those manipulative predators joining their ranks. Joseph concludes his letter still speaking in the voice of God. For I delight in those who diligently seek to know my precepts and abide by the laws of my kingdom. For all things shall be made known to them in mine own due time, and in the end they shall have joy. Joseph God here establishes that God's favor is found only in complying with his wishes. Blind obedience is the order of the day. Delight, joy, happiness. This letter is peppered with carrots to be dangled in front of the devoted, naive, and credulous. Nancy had lived in the shadow of the prophet since she was a young child. Her own father's position in the world was held at Joseph's good favor, producing underlying pressure to please the prophet. He threatens her with lost blessings, God's disfavor, and eternal detriment to her soul. This letter contains every manipulative and coercive tool that a religious predator has at their disposal, draped in flowery language and plied against a youth with such a desperate position of power in their community that it would make Harvey Weinstein blush. To accept Joseph as a true prophet and accept his assertions in this letter as God's will is to accept both prophet and God as abusive, coercive, and manipulative, with the prophet enjoying divine sanction to satisfy his own carnal lusts at the expense of the innocent and vulnerable. Examining the happiness letter for what it is causes a moral person to see Joseph in a new light. The letter shows a side of Joseph that is usually clouded with religious cunning, a secret side which can be perceived when the letter is viewed in the context of its right writing and the subject of its prose and the psychological manipulation in its wording. These same manipulative, subversive, and amoral sentiments are found peppered throughout his sermons and revelations, although they're usually better hidden behind vague allusions, scriptural adornment, and plausible deniability. Every deplorable point in this letter has its equivalent in section 132. Now, Imagine the same words here secretly delivered from some other religious leader to a youth in his congregation over whom he has been licking his lip for years. Would you think such a man spoke for God just because he claimed it? If you rejected his godly claim sanctioned in this act, would you accept any other claimed communication or authority from God by this man? Would you accept it from any other modern church leader of the same? Would you believe any of these six people on the right if they knowing about their sexual predations also gave you pleasant sermons? Would that be something that you would want to internalize? These are the questions that should echo in the heart of a person of conscience when considering the words of the prophet Joseph directed to young Nancy Rigdon in the happiness letter. Every time a church leader invokes the phrase, happiness is the object and design of our existence, these questions scream all the louder. The happiness letter and the circumstances which brought it into existence do not depict a man of God. They are the marks of a wolf who adorned himself with the affectation of godliness in order to exploit the trusting and devoted nature of the people around him. 
It's a credit to the strength and will and courage of Nancy Rigdon that she resisted his predations and raised the alarm to warn others of his nature. She was a whistleblower of the early church. While her efforts were overwhelmed by the forces of other men around her, she stands tall in Mormon history, and we are in her debt for exposing Joseph's hidden character. Thank you. The prophet Joseph Smith said that happiness is the object and the design of our existence and will be the result thereof if we but walk the pathway which leads to it. And that pathway, said he, is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping of all the commandments of God. It was the prophet Joseph who declared, the prophet Joseph Smith taught us, the prophet Joseph Smith taught, the prophet Joseph Smith said, the prophet Joseph Smith taught, the prophet Joseph, the prophet Joseph, the prophet Joseph, 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 the prophet Joseph Smith said, happiness is the object and the design of our existence. The happiness is the object and design of our existence. Happiness is the object and design of our existence. Happiness is the object and design of our existence. Happiness is the object and design of our existence. Happiness. 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 Happiness is the object and the design of our existence, and will be the end thereof if we will but pursue the path which leads to it. And will be the end thereof if we pursue a path that leads to it. And will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And will be the end thereof if we but pursue the path which leads to it. And will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And will be the end thereof. And will be the end thereof. And will be the end thereof. The end thereof. The end thereof. The end thereof. Be the end thereof. 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 If we pursue the path that leads to it. And that path is virtue. 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 Uprightness. 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 Faithfulness. 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 Holiness. 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 And keeping all of the commandments of God. And, and keeping all, all the commandments of God. Keeping, and keeping all, all the commandments of God. And keeping, and keeping all, all the commandments of God. God. The prophet Joseph declared, happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God.